have commented about it's nice to get out, it's nice to be able to see each other again. The Los Alamos Historical Society has as its mission to preserve, to promote, and to communicate the amazing, rich, diverse, and I have to say colorful, history of this community. And events like this help tell those stories. As many of you know, we have now become the full-fledged owners of the Oppenheimer House and our 92-year-old beauty is in serious need of some upgrades and renovations. You can make a donation, we accept it all. But once we have that beautiful house renovated, it provides another avenue and another venue where we can provide these talks and also provide the history of this community. When I meet with different people, and especially people that are new to our community, I like to ask them the question, do you know how you got here? And I think for all of us in this community, it's good to think that it started as a homestead purchased by a master who wanted to have a boy's ranch, and he made that boy's ranch school, something that was known throughout the United States, and as it grew, it provided the perfect place for Abby and Kitty to come to choose that very special master cottage where the, when the Manhattan Project started, and of course the Manhattan Project grew. And all of us are here today, from one way or another, because of that beginning. So once again, we welcome all of you to this event. You are going to enjoy the stories and the tales that Alan has to share with us and remember the history of where you came from if you're living here. Thank you. Now, to the directors here, I'd like to Pay attention to the safety and security issues, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, in the event of an emergency, we will help each other and leave this room through those doors over there or this door on the side. If there were to be a fire, it will be an alarm. And we will follow those directions. Thumbs up? You got it? Excellent. Safe? That's good. Safety. Um, <laughs> Those of you who have visited a legacy of learning here at the Step Up Mesa Library will have noticed that many of the JRMC board members from the past have been level employees who, besides the commitment to national security, they also dedicated time to give back to the New Mexico community. So go around and try to identify those things. They might be our neighbors. In the 50th anniversary, the JRMC is honored to have her director of the Salamos National Lab, and I counted, I think you're 12. Is that right? Sounds about right. <laughs> the director uh, since uh, Oppenheimer, Tom Mason, to join us today and share some words and introduce the speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's, it's wonderful to see everyone together again. I know it reduces a little bit of anxiety. Long, but it's good that we can get back into the mode of doing these uh, sorts of lectures, looking forward to the, the things that have been lined up with the uh, coming speakers. But it's my pleasure tonight to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Los Alamos National Lab historian Alan Parr. Uh, some people might be a little bit surprised that a lab that's you know, really a science and engineering and national security lab would have a uh, historian, and um, in fact, not only do we have historians, we have archivists and archaeologists, and, and the, the reason for that is not just because we're very proud of our history, which we are, uh, but also because understanding that history is really important to our present and our future as a laboratory. Uh, 
particularly in a world where we have to be stewards of a stockpile without testing, knowing what was done and why it was done, uh, is a critical part of our current missions. So as much as we are excited to learn about the history because of all it represents, it's actually uh, very much a today thing as well. And in that role, Alan uh, is, is uh, exemplary, both in terms of communicating about the lab history as he is tonight, and also helping preserve it. Uh, he's a graduate of Texas Tech University, which I think most of you know is in eastern New Mexico. And, uh, <laughs> he's in the and so I think that's uh, probably enough of an introduction, because I know you all came here tonight to hear Alan. So please join me in welcoming Alan. Go after you. I can tell you're all doing well tonight. Is it, is, are we on? We're not on. We're, well, Pack 8 is on. Now we're all on. Hey, it's great. And thanks for all the tech support that we've had tonight. It's great to be here. How about Tom Mason, everyone? Tom Mason. My friends, Sherry, Anna, I think we're going to have uh, fun, I guess, despite kind of the subject matter <laughs> tonight. The Manhattan Project is, uh, of course, an incredible story. Now, a couple things before we, uh, before we jump into the history tonight. Uh, first of all, I'm pretty sure that at least some of you were probably dragged here tonight. You'd probably rather be watching basketball. Can, you want to raise your hand? It's okay. I'm, I'm sympathetic. I've done a little of that myself. Uh, so uh, I actually, I may be asking for score updates throughout the talk tonight, so that's, that's okay. And uh, channeling my inner Billy Joel, I'm going to take a poll here. So uh, who is for Kansas? Okay, okay. Uh, who is for Carolina? So who doesn't care? <laughs> All right, you came to the right place. You came to the right, but again, thank you, Billy Joel, for that one. Um, so, so my talks, I like to give disclaimers. Don't you wish everybody that got up on a stage and gave a talk would give you disclaimers, <laughs> right? And so the first one is uh, regarding the time of this lecture. Some of you may be wondering, well, how long is this going to take? Can I get home to see the end of the game at least? Something like that. Uh, probably not. So uh, I wanted two hours, which would have turned into three. Anna gave me 90 minutes. And by the way, the 90 minutes starts now. Not all this other stuff. That doesn't count. This is, this is my 90 minutes. So I know, uh, where's Andy? Uh, so Andy Trottier, he has started a pool. If you would like to place a wager on the length of the talk, the over-under is 97 minutes. And so we'll see what we do. I think we're going to have, hopefully have some time for Q&A in a little while. So anyway, it is a long talk, but hopefully it'll be fun and uh, interesting as we go through it. The, um, the other thing is, uh, you know, as, as Tom has revealed, I work for the laboratory. Uh, I'm an American. I am the grandnephew of a baton survivor. Now, do you think that these things could possibly have anything to do with the material that I've chosen to show you tonight? Or the, the material I've chosen to omit? So this is why I say, Never trust historians. Don't, don't trust those historians. Yeah, I heard a yeah over there from somebody. You know, you ought to question historians, right? So, so the Manhattan Project lasted for several, several years. It uh, involved hundreds of thousands of people, as we'll see. Uh, I've had to select what I kind of think makes for a good story. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, ne it never exactly comes out the same way. So do be aware that you're getting just a little fraction of the story from somebody who, like all of us, has some biases. So do be aware of those things. I'm going to see what I can cram into the next 95 minutes now. As, uh, as we go ahead and start, it's, uh, the screen's a little bit washed out there. So we may have to turn some. There we go. Oh, see, that was planned. Totally planned there. And there is the, uh, there's the uh, talk. So, uh, and there is the director, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Who brings us all together tonight? So, director, clap for him. He, does, he, he deserves it, you know. And, uh, and I like an interactive talk. So if you want to heckle, heckle away. Uh, that is, uh, that's fine with me. It's good for ratings. Now, one thing is many, uh, oh, I, gotta, I should stay over here in, in, in the light. I like to wander around. I hope that's okay. I'm not the most formal person in the world. So uh, this is not a new talk for me. Actually, this is the first, an iteration of this talk is the very first one that I ever put together uh, about 19 years ago now, which is hard to believe. And uh, it started out on view graphs. If you've ever used view graphs, 
I mean, there's probably people in the audience that don't even know what a view graph is. If you've used a view graph, though, uh, that, that version of the talk didn't go over that well. Uh, hopefully, it's improved. I do welcome your feedback, if it's good. Uh, to, uh, but I think history is important to present in context. And being many, many years ago now a Soviet military historian, it's on this slide that I would go off on a tangent for like three hours. So I'm gonna avoid that today, okay? One thing though is we do talk about the historical context, what was going on in the world leading up to the time of the Manhattan Project. Um, I do think that some of these things that we'll talk about uh, might be useful in kind of understanding things that are going on in the world today. Uh, what's going on in Eastern Europe, some of this, some of that goes way back. The same for uh, out in Asia as well. So I'm going to just run through this, and I do apologize, but uh, let's remember that Hitler and Stalin start World War II together. Now, some of you who have not thought about World War II history in a while, you might think, well, wait a minute. We, the U.S., we were allies with the Soviet Union when the war, uh, you know, against Hitler. Well, that's eventually the case, but it didn't start out that way. And uh, the Cold War, this is not a Cold War talk, but the Cold War is much more deeply rooted, I think, than uh, a lot of people often recognize. To me, it goes back at least to 1917, maybe a lot further than that. But uh, anyway, Hitler and Stalin get together and they start the war. They secretly divide Poland. They announce that they have signed a non-aggression pact, which was quite a shock to the rest of the world. The rest of the world thought, well, those two guys hate each other. They'll never get along. They'll probably end up fighting each other before they attack anyone else. Well, that's not what happened. That was quite a surprise. So uh, Poland gets cut in two. So the German army invades Poland on September 1st, 1939. The Soviet, the Red Army, invades Poland 17 days later. Each country takes half. Now, uh, the United Kingdom and, and France both declare war on Germany after they invade Poland. They had promised to protect Poland, and uh, they did not declare war on the Soviet Union, though, although they almost did. This is gonna come back, I think, into this talk a little bit later. But do remember, uh, the Brits, who are gonna stay with us in the war, France is, is not gonna last very long, unfortunately. But, uh, but anyway, the Brits are not very happy with the Soviet Union. They consider war plans and almost declare war on them, I would guess. The reason that they didn't was, can you imagine if you're the United Kingdom declaring war on Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union? at the same time. Uh, but I think there are those in uh, Britain who would have liked to do that. So, uh, so anyway, this is how World War II begins. The United States is still a couple of years, two and a half years or so away from getting involved as an active combatant. Okay, so this, the, the war kind of evolves slowly here. Now, the next thing that happens is that uh, we're gonna talk about Soviet aggression, okay? And uh, by the way, oh, I forgot, a disclaimer. Uh, if you're like a communist or a member, or you like the Soviet Union, you may not be happy with some of my remarks. We'll see how this goes. So just to get that out there, but, uh, but Stalin is going to start out by doing some very bad things. So you can see on the map over here, which is actually to continue to hold my card as a historian, we do have to have multiple maps in each presentation. And I like maps, I hope you do too. And so you see all the lightly pink shaded area over there? That's new territory that Stalin's gonna go take in the opening phases of the war. So first he invades Finland. You can see that he forcefully extracts some land from Finland there in the uh, light pink region. Now this was known as the Winter War. Has anybody heard of the Winter War before? So we have winter, okay, that's good because most people don't remember. The Red Army actually does really bad for a variety of reasons. First of all, uh, don't know if we've got anyone planning on invading Finland, but I would recommend not doing it in the winter. <laughs> good, good start. Uh, also, the, uh, you know, the terrain was favorable for the defenders. Uh, the, the soldiers in Finland were pretty well trained, pretty well equipped, they had a defensive line, but I would say probably the single most important reason that the Soviet Union did so poorly in Finland was that Stalin had decapitated their military. And so between 30 and 40,000 Red Army officers were put in gulags or taken out and shot. That will leave a mark on your military. And that mark was showed to the world when Stalin went into Finland. The Finns were able to fight off the Red Army for months and months before eventually ceding that uh, that space. So you see Finland up there. The next thing is you can see on the screen the Soviet Union annexes roughly 20% of Romania. You can see that on the map there as well. And also forcefully annexes Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And again, remember they've got half of Poland as well. Now this may be ancient history to a lot of us, but I can assure you that the people who live in those countries that I just mentioned have not forgotten these things. Okay, and so, uh, so anyway, that's what the Soviet Union is doing. I think that's actually record speed for me getting through slide number one. Come on, there we go. All right, 
This is the part of the story people know a little bit more. What the Germans are up to. And you can see they kind of, I hope I didn't, did I do that? Oh, okay. I thought about, me and technology just don't, don't mix. T tip off, do we have a score? Uh, I, know, I know some of you, see I'm trying to catch who's watching on their phone. I know some of you are, but, uh, but anyways, we go through this, uh, you know this part of the story, and so the Germans take their half of Poland, then they invade Denmark in more ways in April 1940, uh, and then of course they use Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, basically as a big highway to go into France. Now, as we're gonna see, World War II is a series of pretty massive strategic miscalculations. One of our early ones is that a lot of people thought, well, if anybody can put up a fight against the Germans, it's the French like this national tradition of being invaded by Germany. They know what's coming. That's the great German national pastime, right? 1870, 1914, they're due. So France builds a wall, the Maginot Line to keep Germans out. The Germans, uh, long story short, and yes, I know there's a lot more to it, kind of just go around it and France collapses in only about six weeks. So this is a big uh-oh, because we, uh, it'd be nice if we had France in this fight. It's a little bit blurry here. Is it a little bit blurry there? And we're still checking it a little bit, but, uh, but we'll get that cleared up in just a second. And so France collapses. At this point, Italy joins in and says, well, there's pretty much nobody left to conquer, so we'll join on the side of the Axis. And so now we have fascist Italy involved in the war as well. So who's left? Remember on our map a while ago, it's kind of down to the United Kingdom. Remember, the United States is not involved in the war as an active combatant at this point in time. And so, uh, so anyway, the Germans, the Battle of Britain. If you don't know about the Battle of Britain, watch the movie, right? You know, that covers pretty much everything you need to know. And uh, so, so anyway, the Battle of Britain happens. Hitler wants to quickly knock the United Kingdom out of the war. They try and destroy the Royal Air Force. They bomb the Royal Air Force, and that doesn't work as quickly as Hitler wants. And so they start bombing cities instead to try and terrorize the people of southern England. That doesn't work either. And of course, this is going to be costly to the Germans because they're losing airplanes and air crews, every sortie that they're flying over the United Kingdom, right? Why is that going to be a problem for Hitler, though? He's conquered everything else. Well, Hitler has watched the farce that unfolded back in Finland and decided, you know, we really don't like the, uh, the Soviets, and they're even weaker than we thought. And by the way, the Germans were not the only ones who thought that. We had military attaches in Moscow. Much of the world thought that the uh, Soviet Union would just collapse like a house of cards, right? if the Germans invaded. And so German, Germany is planning to invade the Soviet Union because they need every resource they can. The Battle of Britain comes to a pretty abrupt halt and the Germans make a mistake. They assume that the United Kingdom has been isolated. They pose no strategic threat to us. We'll invade the Soviet Union instead. Now this operation is known as Barbarossa. I don't know if anybody's heard the code name before, uh, but this is by far the largest military invasion in history. By far, you had roughly three and a half million German soldiers, uh, and of course the Finns want their land back, right? The Hungarians, Romanians are allies. Uh, just about three and a half million soldiers against about three and a half million soldiers in the Soviet Union on opening day. So imagine about seven million soldiers riding along a front that runs from the circle in Finland all the way to the east. So this is warfare on a scale uh, the likes of which the United States has really never seen. And I will have some numbers that will bear that out in just a little while. So the Germans go in. They assume that the Soviet Union is going to last for a couple of months, maybe three. We'll be done by the end of summer. Why should we even take our coats along, right? And uh, this doesn't go very well. The Germans go into the Soviet Union, and uh, they just annihilate hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers in massive encircling operations. Uh, and uh, Stalin helped because Stalin ordered his soldiers to stand and fight and be encircled. Well, that eventually changes. The Soviet Union's able to hang on for a variety of factors. For one, they've got a lot of people. They can just keep pushing people up to the front of the line. They also had some equipment that was surprisingly good to the Germans. Uh, also, eventually Stalin allowed his soldiers to retreat, and that's a nice advantage in a place like the Soviet Union because you have an endless vacuum to retreat into. And then, as we're burning through time, surviving using those things, what's happening in Russia in the fall? It's starting to get cold, isn't it? And uh, so anyway, despite all of these things, despite the long supply lines and that, that had to be defended by the Germans, their lack of uh, winter equipment, all these things, the Germans are able to push their way to Moscow by the end of 
1941. Now remember that because we're going to talk about important things, other important things that happened in December of 1941 as well. There at Moscow, the Soviets had prepared a massive counterattack. They stopped the Germans there and pushed them back a little ways. Both sides are completely exhausted. And there, the war pretty much literally freezes in place in the opening couple of months of 1942. So that's where we're going to be. Pretty I would have asked if, uh, if I missed anything, but I, I probably missed like all of it. But uh, let's, keep, uh, let's keep going. And let's talk about some things happening out in the Pacific. So we've got Europe taken care of. Now remember, December 1941, what's happening in Europe? The German army is being pushed back at Moscow. December 7th, 1941, everybody knows that date, right? If you don't, you better remember this for the test. Remember for the, uh, for the test there. But of course, we all remember that date. And one of these questions, and I'm going to see how quickly I can microwave an answer, that hopefully you're thinking about is, well, why? Well, why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? So I'm going to give you a really quick answer to that from the American perspective. You think the Japanese, you think the Imperial Japanese have a different perspective on this? They might. You can ask me about that during Q&A. They're not paying me tonight, so they, uh, we're going to skip them for now. So anyway, uh, we are going to start our story very quickly. Back in 1904-1905, Japan successfully fights a war with Imperial Russia. Okay? This emboldens them to move on to continental Asia. 1905, they invade Korea. So you see Korea over there on the map? Um, we're going to jump forward to the end of World War II, to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, that's part of our story tonight, an important part of our story. Did you know that thousands of Koreans were killed in both of the atomic attacks? Thousands. If you look at the numbers, it's something that is not widely advertised. Uh, why? Well, 40 years earlier, Imperial Japan moved into their country and basically made it a big forced labor camp. Okay? A lot more to the story, as we all know, but do take a moment to think about that from the Korean perspective. 40 years and of course, the Koreans who were there were forced laborers who were turning Hiroshima and Nagasaki, other cities as well, into fortresses to meet a possible invasion. And so, uh, so anyway, years later, the, uh, the Japanese go into Manchuria. You can see on, uh, that on the map as well. They take strategic portions of coastal China. What finally forces the issue with the United States is when they invade French Indochina. So French Indochina is today Southeast Asia, countries that you know, uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, so on, right? Now back then, collectively known as French Indochina, why? Because they're French colonies. France has been knocked out of the war, and so what's Japan gonna do to those colonies? Put them under new management. And this is where the United States finally draws a line in the sand and says, no, this, this can't go on, for two reasons. First of all, I know this may surprise you, but it was the great American dream back then to manu uh, manufacture cheap trinkets in uh, Ohio, Michigan maybe, and to sell them to the people of Asia and make a lot of money. <laughs> it didn't work out that way. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, when Japan's doing that, that's bad for business. We don't like that. We want to make money, and Japan's taking over all of these customers. I, I mean, victims, right? That's part of it, but I do mention the word victims. A lot of people don't realize how absolutely brutal the Japanese occupation was. Some of you may, some of you may have seen books uh, on this topic, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. And I will mention here, and uh, all of you who are watching the game on your phone, you can go to a reliable source like uh, Wikipedia, and uh, you can Google in there uh, to check what I'm about to say to you. I'm gonna add a lot of qualifiers on here, but it is possible that Imperial Japan outmurdered Nazi Germany. The numbers are sketchy, okay, because when you're committing mass murder, you'd like them to be sketchy. But think about that for a minute. To even put those two in the same sentence, that's saying something. And so there was already a great humanitarian crisis that was unfolding under Japanese rule. We were not very happy about that either. So we want to send a message, right? So what are we going to do? Sanctions. Oh, yeah. We're going to sanction them. Well, look, hey, sanctions can be pretty nasty, right? And uh, we impose some on the Japanese. So as you see, by the way, anybody know what the formal name of the Japanese empire is? It's not the Japanese empire. It's not the land of the rising sun. It is, and this will be on the test as well. No, I'll be nice to you. Um, it is called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. <laughs> Who wants to move there? <laughs> Yeah, you, you don't. But, uh, but anyway, it sounds good, but, uh, but it's uh, a very, very unpleasant 
uh, place. Uh, for the test, you can simply refer to it as Japan Incorporated, okay? And so what Japan Incorporated does, they're going to go in there, they're going to take over your country, extract your resources, but even with many of the resources offered, there's not a whole lot of oil there at least at the point that we're talking about in 1941. The United States, and this might surprise you too, well, maybe not anymore, but uh, back then the United States was the world's leading exporter of oil. We sold more oil than any other country. We also sold scrap metal and things like that. And guess who one of our best customers was? It's Japan. And so we're going to cut off their supply. Now, you can't expand the borders of the co-prosperity sphere without American resources. So this forces the Japanese to make a decision. They can apologize and go home, or they didn't opt for that, or we can finally settle this conflict in the Pacific. Okay, and uh, this conflict, this economic conflict in the Pacific between the Japan and the United States had been going on for decades and decades at this point. Uh, Japan felt that uh, this was a war of survival. In order to continue, and I guess it was a war of survival because World War II is going to eliminate Imperial Japan, as we shall see. But, uh, but anyway, they thought uh, this called for a pretty bold stroke. We're going to settle affairs in the Pacific once and for all. We are going to uh, invade the Philippines. We're going to attack Pearl Harbor. Uh, look, the Americans, not everybody felt this way in Japan, but the prevailing view was America doesn't want to fight. We, we haven't helped our friends, the British or the French. If they go get oil in, I don't know, Indonesia instead, where there is a lot of oil, what are they going to do about it? They don't want to fight. Their economy is in no shape to fight. The Great Depression is still going on, of course. And so uh, we'll make sure that they can't fight by destroying the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. So that's the plan. Sounds pretty good. But guess what? This is going to be another one of those pretty massive strategic miscalculation. If, I'm not going to go through what happened in the Pacific War because that's not what this talk about, is about tonight. But guess what? I have a one-line summary of the Pacific War, and it's provided by Admiral Hara Tadaichi there, one of the architects of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So remember, Japan wants to attack the Pacific fleet. They want to own the Pacific within a week, maybe two. That's the plan. Uh, so they're looking for a strategic victory. Instead, they get a pretty impressive tactical victory. One victory on a long road. Japan is not ready to fight a long war, and this gamble is not going to pay off. And again, you can see the Admiral's quote there. There it is. We won a great tactical victory at Pearl Harbor, and thereby lost the war. So again, Japan is not prepared to fight this war. Same thing with Germany. Germany gets into a war that lasts a lot longer than they think that it is, and uh, things are not going to end well for them. But I know a lot of you came here to see something science-y. <laughs> right? Right? It's Los Alamos. So behold, my uh, old Atomic Energy Commission chart. And of course, we get to go back in time again, this time to 1938. I should really start watching my watch a little bit. But, uh, but anyway, it's Germany. It's Nazi Germany. And when I mention Nazi Germany, what things come into your mind? Probably some pretty horrible things, right? Uh, you know, death camps and, and people being persecuted. Uh, the war, of course, which the Germans started. All of these different things. So fission is first. Well, I say first. I think Fermi produced it earlier but didn't realize it. It's okay. He won a Nobel Prize anyway. So he's all right. But anyway, uh, but anyway these two chemists, Fritz Strassmann, Otto Hahn, they produced barium by uh, bombarding uranium with neutrons. Now... Who thought that was exciting? We did. Yeah, Tom thought it was a good, it's okay, you know, be proud, right? That's a, so, so anyway, I'm going to try and make it a little bit more exciting. So what's the big deal here? Well, this process is going to be known, become known as fission. Uh, so we've got a couple of physicists, Lisa Meitner and her nephew Otto Frisch. Otto's going to end up back in the story because he's going to be a group leader at Los Alamos in a few more slides. They identify this process as nuclear fission. And so what is fission? talk about it all the time, but a lot of people don't realize what it is. I'm probably not the best person to explain it, but I shall give it my best effort tonight. So you take the nucleus of an atom. It's got a bunch of neutrons and pro uh, protons in there that are held together by forces that we still don't completely understand the strong force. Uh, and for a long time, 1920s, before that, didn't think that it was possible to split the nucleus of an atom. But what if you could? What if you could split the nucleus of an atom? You might be able to release a lot of energy if you break up that force. Fission is breaking up that force. So we break that, you split the nucleus of an atom, 
Some protons and neutrons go off over there. Some more protons and neutrons go over there. And there are some neutrons that just go out by themselves. And what's going to happen to them? Well, eventually they're going to go off and hit some other nuclei of atoms and release some energy. So you split the nucleus of an atom, you might be able to release some energy. What if you could start a chain reaction and split the nuclei of a lot of atoms? You might be able to release a lot of energy. And what's that starting to sound like to you? Maybe a bomb, maybe some kind of weapon or something like that. So hopefully my explanation and the chart uh, made all of that as clear as we're going to get. But uh, scientists immediately realized the potential for an atomic bomb. In fact, some scientists had already been thinking about it for a while, all right? So, um, so here's the thing. Do you want the short version of the story? You want the short version. Yeah, Gene wants the short version of the story. So Albert Einstein recognizes the great peril of this situation. Nazi Germany has produced vision. He wants to warn the president about it. So he sends the president a letter, and the Manhattan Project is born. Good. Well, that's a short version. But short versions are not always right. Okay, so let's add a little bit more to this. Now, one of those scientists thinking about fission long before this was Leo Szilard. And uh, I bet in this room a lot of you have heard of Leo Szilard. If you've not heard of Leo, don't feel bad because not a lot of people have, even today, and certainly nobody knew who, uh, knew who Leo was way back then. So he is thinking about fission. He's actually taken out some patents in the United Kingdom on this new technology that might be possible as a result of this. But... Uh, but yeah, if he sends a letter to President Roosevelt, you think President Roosevelt's going to see it? Do you think a bureaucrat 20 levels below the president is going to see it? Do you think it's going to just go into the trash, maybe? Uh, you know, Leo recognizes this. He goes to his good friend Albert Einstein. Have we heard of Albert Einstein before? Of course we have, because he's such an important part of laboratory history. He was like the director or something here, wasn't he? Something. <laughs> I forget, but watch that movie they're making. They'll get it right. Um, but, um, but anyway, Albert Einstein's Albert Einstein. So if he sends a letter, the president might see it. At least maybe somebody close. So Zillard goes to Einstein. They write this letter together, which you see over there on the right-hand side of the screen. And I can't read that there, for, and I'm, so I'm going to paraphrase. By the way, if you haven't caught on already, I do a lot of paraphrasing. Assume my paraphrases are not like accurate. Like, Don't quote from this if you're doing like a history project for school or something. That would be a bad idea. But anyway, this letter, I think that there's an argument to be made that this letter might have slowed down the coming of the Manhattan Project. <gasps> Don't throw anything at me. Let me explain. So we look at the bottom of this letter, Einstein and Szilard, and you can see there's a picture of them writing a fake copy of the letter like after the war. Totally a historical reenactment there. Uh, but they describe the weapon system. I want you to tell me, is this a good weapon or not? We could take a really big boat fill it with uranium ore, send it into a port, and destroy the port and much of the surrounding area. Who is in for that? Good weapon? I saw, yeah, so, so yeah, you clapping. You're the captain of that boat. Good luck. <laughs> That's, hey, hey, fair enough. I, I love the interaction, so that's good. So that's good, that, uh, but I, don't, I, don't, I think we can do better. We can do better, can't we? And we have done better. And so uh, when you talk about putting a, a boat into an enemy harbor and blowing it up, does that, that's not a futuristic weapon. What that is is an accident that happened more than 20 years earlier. Some of you may have heard of the Halifax explosion before. So back during the Great War, we have a fully laden ammo ship leaving the Canadian port of Halifax. It collides with another ship, starts a fire. You really don't want a fire on board an ammo ship. That is your safety tip of the night. And uh, so anyway, after burning for 10, 15 minutes, it ignites the main cargo. The boat explodes, releasing three kilotons of energy on the port of Halifax. Completely accidentally. Now, to put that in perspective, Little Boy, which was used to destroy Hiroshima, that's 15 kilotons. This is a three kiloton accident. So what they've described is not the future, but the past. So why would you take a lot of your really bright people and, and, and give them a lot of money to figure out a more complex and less certain way of doing something that had already been done on accident? So eventually, one of the president's advisors gets a copy of this letter, talks to the president about it, and the president authorizes not the Manhattan Project, but a small committee called the Uranium Advisory Committee to start looking at this process. And to show that he means business, 
he gives them a full $6,000. Yeah, at the lab, we just spent $6,000, just like that. There's another $6,000, right? So this is not the Manhattan Project. It's just very small scale, and that's how we're going to start things out. So your question, I know that you're, what you're thinking, well, Alan, how do we get from reactors to bombs? It turns out I have a slide on that. And uh, I don't know if we have any British friends here, but I do have a presentation on British contributions to the Manhattan Project, maybe for another night, because they are really important to our story. Remember the short version of the story that I told a few minutes ago? Did I even mention the Brits? Yeah, they, 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 they don't like that. So let's, let's give them a little bit of, uh, we'll give them a bullet tonight, fair enough? We'll give them one. So, uh, so anyway, in the United Kingdom, remember, well I should say, here in the United States, we have an Austrian and we have a German, Frisch, uh, and, or I'm sorry, we have a, uh, here in the United States we have a Hungarian, Zillard, and we have a German, Einstein. We have two Axis-born scientists helping to get things kind of going. Two Axis-born scientists write to the British government as well. These are Otto Frisch, who we met earlier, as well as Rudolf Peierls, who was a German. Uh, they write to the British government and uh, in what is creatively known as the Frisch Peierls memo. Uh, hey, we think that you could turn uh, this fission business into a super bomb. Now, a couple of things are different. First of all, they're talking about a super bomb, uh, maybe something you could even drop out of an airplane, destroy a big chunk of the city. The other thing is that the United Kingdom is at war. Do you think that they are interested in producing cheap electricity? Because that was kind of the focus of the first Uranium Advisory Committee here in the United States. Well, this, this boat business looks kind of dumb, but what if we could make a reactor and make limitless electricity? That sounds like a good idea. Are the Brits interested in cheap electricity? No, they're interested in Survival, right? Weapons, because they keep Germans out of the country. So anyway, the British sponsor a feasibility study. This becomes known as the Mod Committee. The Mod Committee uh, puts together a report over several months, and they predict in the early summer of 1941 that if everything goes just right, we might have the material for bomb number one by the end of 1943. Now this is a big deal, because again, they're talking about super bombs, not boats, and it's within reach. It's not 50 years away, it's like maybe a couple of years away. So it's doable, and these are two very, very important things. The, the British are fighting by themselves at this point, and uh, you know, think about the reaction in London when the Soviet Union is invaded by Germany. Do you think the Brits were excited about that? Well, let's, let's not forget, uh, they started the war with Hitler, right? We don't like them, we don't trust them, and oh yeah, remember the last thing? The Brits, like the Germans and us, thought, well, these guys aren't gonna last more than a few months anyway. So maybe kind of a tepid response to having this new ally. What do the Brits want to win the war? America, say it with me. America, right, they want America to get in, just like in World War I, we're gonna show up and win the day, but how? How do we get the United States involved is the question. They decided they were going to send a top secret mission to the United States with copies of all of their secret reports, including the Mod Committee report. Well, how's that going to get the United States involved? Because this is how. We'll show the Americans that nuclear weapons are a transformative new technology and they are at hand. And guess where fission was produced first? Maybe the Americans will help us prevent the Fuhrer from having a nuclear monopoly. So that's the thinking. So the Mod Committee report makes its way to the United States. It gets locked in a safe for a couple of months where it can't hurt anybody, fortunately. Uh, finally, a guy named Vannevar Bush gets a hold of it. Have you heard of Vannevar before? So he's in charge of the Office of Scientific Research and the Development. They're the ones who are doing the reactor work with a little bit of bomb work on the side. He looks at it, and I think that that report really helped to shift American thinking from reactors to bombs. So Brits, Thank you, come on, they deserve it. I mean, they never, they never get credit. So we're grateful to the Brits tonight, of course. Uh, now, just as we're starting to think about atomic bombs, what happens? Pearl Harbor at almost the same time. So we have this massive national distraction at that point. But we are really starting to think about nuclear weapons. And in the opening months, you have scientists around the country who are starting to give serious thought about weapons instead of reactors as, as the primary focus. So things shift. Now, we have a weapons design, a, a top secret, sharing that with you tonight, top secret weapons design conference at a public university. Nothing wrong there, right? I don't know if we have any security people here. Uh, I don't think this is 
reportable any longer. But we're going to have a top secret conference at Berkeley University. Now, as we all know here, scientists are capable of many good and great things, right? Right? Scientists, yes. But what about like massive construction projects? Maybe, I don't know, maybe we can chance it. What about building factories all over the United States simultaneously? That might not be the specialty, but who is good at building massive factories all over the place? Because we should probably shift all these top secret conferences, I don't know, maybe to somewhere more secure. But we don't have a place yet. Well, that's going to change because we're going to call up the Army Corps of Engineers. So the Army Corps of Engineers gets the job, says, look, this is a top secret project. We're going to need factories. We're going to need them fast. We're going to need all kinds of things. Can you help us out? The Army Corps of Engineers is totally on board. Now, keep in mind, as we saw on the beginning slide, this is history's most secret project. And so the Army Corps of Engineers gets the project and decides to call it the Manhattan Project. Well, uh, we'll just name it after headquarters. That'll throw the enemy off. Right? Now, we, hey, Army, love the Army here, of course. Good job, Army. We love the Army. But uh, this was actually pretty standard procedure with the Corps of Engineers, right? You name a big project, you name the headquarters after wherever the headquarters is located. So that's where the Manhattan Project gets its name from. Now, the other thing is, we are going to need leadership. We're going to need a dynamic leader with a lot of experience that can bring a lot of people together. And uh, we get that guy over there. Colonel Leslie R. Groves, Leslie Richard Groves, uh, he, uh, he was not well liked at Los Alamos. He preferred to be called Dick, which was not a problem here, actually. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, Colonel Groves gets the, uh, gets the job. I came over to the dark, so I wouldn't be on camera. For that. But uh, not well liked, but incredibly effective. We will have many good things to say about General Groves, uh, really a hero of the Manhattan Project. He gets the job because he is a highly educated engineer, very experienced. So who's been to the Pentagon lately, driven by, flown over the Pentagon, seen a picture of the Pentagon? I believe at one point the largest building on the face of the planet. And he built it in about 18 months. Yeah, he built the Pentagon faster than like the FOIA process works. That is remarkable. And so he gets rewarded with, with us. Is he excited? No, he's not. Why? He wants to go kill Germans, Japanese, Italian. Doesn't matter. He wants a field assignment, right? He gets stuck with uh, the Buck Rogers assignment instead. Not very happy about that, uh, but being the good soldier he is, he accepts his orders and he starts negotiating. So they tell General, uh, well, oh, I let the cat out of the bag. They tell Colonel Groves, now Colonel Groves, if you're successful, this project could win the war. Might even save the world. And again, paraphrasing, uh, Colonel Groves says, wow, and you're going to entrust a colonel with that kind of responsibility. <laughs> so he becomes General Groves. And then General Groves, General Groves says, well, look, I, uh, I'm going to need like priority to get this job done. Everything's rationed in the country. To get the job done, I'm going to need like top priority for people, materials, etc. They say, General, you've got top priority over everything else now. Congratulations. Now, here's the next thing. And, and whenever I give this talk, I encourage people, especially people if you're working at the lab, savor what I'm about to say because you will probably never hear it again. He says, uh, he says, look, I don't, uh, this is great, I'm a general, well-deserved, and uh, I have a limitless, uh, uh, well, I have, I have top priority now, but I need money to buy all that stuff. General, you have a bottomless cost code. You know what, we're going to get rid of cost codes, we don't care. What kind of lab would that be, huh? <laughs> but anyway, we've got a highly motivated, experienced, educated general with an unlimited budget and top priority. So things are going to start happening a little bit faster at this point in time. Let's go to another slide, or try to. Everybody having fun? Yeah. Having fun? Good. Good, good, good. Now, uh, also... I'm not entirely comfortable with this, but uh, again, part of my contract, I do have to acknowledge that there were, in fact, other sites besides Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project. It's, uh, as you can see, there were a lot of other sites uh, from the Manhattan Project. We think our good friends at DOE, I think they're the ones who put this map together. But you'll notice over there that it's been estimated, I think by Alex Wellerstein, for those of you who like to read his blog, uh, he did some research, estimated that about half a million people touched the Manhattan Project at one point or another during its existence. Half a million people, that's a lot of people. Uh, at the peak never got close to that. Uh, 
it was, there was a horrible attrition problem within the Manhattan Project, because guess what? It was not a pleasant place to work. Uh, but anyway, the Manhattan Project is huge, and we have others besides uh, those of us here in Los Alamos who are going to participate. So really, quick slide there. So let's talk about the big three. Okay, the big three. And uh, we're going to start with the Clinton Engineer Works, also known as Side X, Y12, Oak Ridge, all of these good terms. Many of you have probably been there. Some of you may have even been managers there before. I don't, I don't know. Possibly in the room here. But, uh, but anyway, if you're going to make an atomic bomb, you have to have fissionable material for it, right? How do you get fissionable material. Well, that turns out to be a really big problem and continues to be, I guess, fortunately, for the world. So we're going to secure a location in Tennessee. There's a lot of stories about why it's Tennessee, but the basic story is, have you heard of the TVA before? And I'm talking about, like, not the Time Variance Authority, like the original <laughs> TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. During the Great Depression, we're going to build hydro uh, hydroelectric dams up and down all of the rivers of eastern Tennessee to bring electricity to rural America. And that's exactly what we're going to do with it, kind of. Uh, we're going to build all these plants in rural America. So we have an isolated location with a lot of excess electricity. Sounds like a good place for a uranium enrichment plant to be. And so uh, enriched uranium is going to be one of our materials that we're going to use in nuclear weapons. And enriching uranium is no joke. You need the good stuff. You need U-235. Well, there's other isotopes like U-238. How do you separate one isotope from the other when those isotopes are like almost chemically identical? Well, you're gonna need a lot of electricity. You're gonna need a lot of factories to do that. In fact, General Groves is gonna outdo himself by building what I believe is the world's new, at least back then, largest building under one roof, and that's it, the K-25 gaseous diffusion plant. It's now just an open field. But uh, anyway, it's gonna take the biggest plant in the world to do this, and that's just one building at one location of the Manhattan Project. Again, to give you some sense of scale of how big this is. Uh, I should mention as well, we always like to talk, and rightfully so, about the scientists here at Los Alamos, the heroes of the Manhattan Project. Of course, we honor J. Robert Oppenheimer, our first director tonight. We never talk about construction workers. Who, who are the unsung heroes of the Manhattan Project? Construction workers, that was the most common job. Why? Because there was nothing. So they're gonna build all these things very quickly in conditions that are really not very awesome, to be honest with you. Uh, so anyway, that's what we're going to do there. Also, you'll see the uh, picture up on the top left up there, that's the X-10 reactor. So the world's first reactor is gonna be built at Stagfield in Chicago, the University of Chicago by Enrico Fermi and his team. The first prototype production reactor, which I believe Tom gives a very good video on, if you can track that down, is located there. So it's like the practice prototype reactor for making plutonium, which is gonna segue into our next slide. But uh, anyway, if you go out to visit Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Y12, if you're in the area, stop by X10, because it looks exactly like it does in the picture, even now, except now it's brought to you in color. And uh, those two guys holding that rod are mannequins. But it looks just like that. They've done a wonderful job out there checking that out. So anyway, that is what we've got starting out there. Now, uh, Hanford. We're gonna to go to Eastern Washington. Again, sparsely populated. We have a big river going through there, the Columbia River. Comes in handy as a coolant for your reactors. We're gonna make plutonium out here. And yes, I know that the picture is more modern up there on the right, but I wanted to get a color picture of something related to this. And the 40s were not in color. They were actually, life was in black and white there. So I've reintroduced color into the 1940s, kind of. But uh, we're gonna make plutonium. Making plutonium is not easy either. We're going to make it in reactors. And so we are going to take Fermi's original reactor. We're gonna take the work that was done at X10 and we're going to multiply it at Hanford to make a lot of plutonium very quickly in the reactors, okay? We talked about the Columbia River a little bit already. DuPont is gonna be one of our many, many corporate partners in all of this. And uh, I think that we're finally ready for Los Alamos. And another picture of Oppenheimer, finally. I know some of you feel shortchanged and you want your money back. Uh, but here we are, uh, finally to come back here. So. Let's say that you do have a lot of fissionable material. Uh, that's great, but who's gonna figure out how to make it into a bomb? Who's going to design it? Who's going to build it? Who's going to test it? And who's going to help figure, the, uh, figure out the best way to deliver it in combat? We need a nuclear weapons laboratory. And here we are, so this is... This is where we start right here. So, uh, so anyway, General Groves is introduced to J. Robert Oppenheimer, and uh, these two guys really hit it off. And uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this relationship because 
you'll be hearing from Jim Konetkin in a couple of weeks, and he wrote the book on the subject. So we're going to save that for the real authority. But despite the many differences of these two individuals, they really form a great partnership. Now, as I refer to them as a partnership, let me emphasize, Oppenheimer is General Groves' subordinate. Everybody in the Manhattan Project was subordinate to General Groves. So if you've heard Oppenheimer referred to as like the, the co-director of the Manhattan Project, the scientific director of the Manhattan Project, he was the director of Los Alamos, which is the best job in the world, right? So it should be anyway. But, uh, but anyway, Oppenheimer is an interesting pick. Uh, there are some really nice qualifications. For instance, he is considered America's leading theoretical physicist, at least one of the leading American theoretical physicists. So that's good on the resume. The other thing is he was at that conference back at Berkeley that I mentioned earlier. He already knows about the project. He knows a little bit about weapons design. Uh, and he's available. You know, there were Americans who had Nobel Prizes like Arthur Compton, E.O. Lawrence. They were already running other parts of the Manhattan Project. So who's really bright, who knows a little bit about this, and who can we take without disrupt disrupting another part of the operation? So there he is. Are there reasons why you wouldn't want J. Robert Oppenheimer to be your director? Yeah, there, maybe. I guess we have to cover that, right? Uh, well, for one thing, uh, he'd never led anything before. Now... <laughs> I've always assumed being the director like Tom is a cool job, right? You get the great view up there. So I'm down on the first floor. We don't do windows. I think they're banned down there. But, uh, but you know, it's a pretty, pretty good job that, uh, that we have uh, there being the director. But how would you like to be the director of a place like Los Alamos having never made a management decision ever? It could be tough, but that's okay because can it be that hard? I mean, we're only going to need him and like 100 people to get the job done. He'll figure it out. Yeah, it got bigger than that. The other thing is that some considered him to be a pretty significant security risk. Now, remember, back in the 1930s, communism was nearly mainstream. Some would even say that it was mainstream. Why? How could something that terrible be mainstream? Well, the Great Depression's going on. You're trying to live off the land on the Great Plains. You've seen the pictures of people waiting in line at soup kitchens. I don't know about you, but if somebody came along and said, hey, have we got a system for you? Everybody's free and equal and has a place to live and a job and an important role to play as an individual in the greater collective. You know, that sounds pretty good to me if I don't know where my child's next meal is coming from. How about you? And it sounded like a good idea to a lot of people in the United States. Now, Oppenheimer was pretty comfortable with far left politics, but not particularly active until, politically active, until what? He met a girl. And her name was Jean, and she was not a Republican. <laughs> she wasn't a Democrat either. What was she? Yeah, she's a communist. And so guess what young Bob gets interested in? Yeah, he starts going to meeting, contributing to communist causes, but never actually joins the party. But his brother does. Jean's a member of the party. His eventual wife, Kitty, is a member of the party. His sister-in-law is a member of the party. I'm sure maybe a few of his students at Berkeley were members of the party, some of his friends there too. Now when you put in your security paperwork and you list all of your friends and family members and they're all commies, that's not gonna look good. And there were people who did not want to give him a clearance. General Groves uh, intervenes, they give him a clearance and they watch him. Has anybody been to the Bradbury Science Museum? You've seen that document? I saw Linda, where's my buddy Linda over there? There she is, the other director in the room. Yes, you can see over there, they've got this great document about Oppenheimer's personal security. So General Groves writes to him personally and says, hey Bob, look, he doesn't call him Bob, he says, my dear Dr. Oppenheimer. I take liberties, okay? Uh, but, uh, but anyway, says, look, we can't afford to lose you. Your safety is of paramount importance, so don't travel by plane. Uh, and if you even leave Los Alamos, You've got to have an armed guard with you who can even serve as your chauffeur to keep you safe. <laughs> so the director's being watched. <laughs> but anyway, Oppenheimer turns out to be, uh, uh, as we all know, an amazing pick. An amazing pick to be our first director here at the laboratory. Uh, we've covered most of this already. Again, uh, at its peak, the Manhattan Project employed 129,000 people simultaneously. Remember, people are cycling through as disgruntled construction workers and other things, so we do have a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people who are part of this. Here at Los Alamos, our technical staff peaked at about 1,700 people during the war. So our technical staff is a disproportionately small part of the Manhattan Project, but I would say 
pretty important one too. And by the way, before we leave this slide, that uh, record that you see over there on your right is the first page of the first Los Alamos report. That is LA1. So my buddy Albert over there, who's worked uh, at the laboratory, he's seen, you know, you've, Albert's seen it. You've all seen these gigantic monstrosities of report numbers at the lab, right? They just keep going and going, but there's an LA1. Yeah, and that's the first page of it, the Los Alamos Primer. So we have our first technical conference at the laboratory, uh, major technical conference, in April of 1943. This is the Los Alamos Primer Conference. What do we know about nuclear technologies and how should we build an atomic bomb? So that's how it all starts. So remember that date, uh, April of 1943. That's kind of the lab's birthday, if you will. That conference was April 5th to April 8th, if I remember correctly. Uh, and uh, so that's how it begins. Oh, man. Looks like I'm going to owe Andy lunch. Yeah, OK. Everybody's still having fun, though, right? OK, that's, that's good. Uh, I am going to just skip over this, because I know that I have taken more time, as always, than I should have. But I do think it's important to note that uh, we were very concerned what the Germans, in particular, might be doing in regards to building nuclear weapons during the war. So if you're in Washington, you're trying to catch a clandestine nuclear weapons laboratory. Who better to go to than your own clandestine nuclear weapons laboratory to track down the bad guys? And so the earliest intelligence taskings that the laboratory received uh, that I've been able to find is from the spring of 1944. So we've been in this business for a very long time. You can see the idea there that uh, Captain Parsons, Captain Parsons was one of two associate directors during the war. Um, and I think I saw Nancy Bartlett. She'd be mad if I didn't mention Captain Parsons. I know that. Uh, he wrote a memo to General Groves, copied Oppenheimer. Look at the title of it down here, if you can see that. Possible use of radioactive poison in rocket-propelled unmanned aircraft. Captain Parsons was scared that the Germans might do that. What has he maybe sort of kind of just invented? Like a, like a dirty bomb. Well, I heard drone back there. But uh, anyway, he thought of that. Fortunately, the Germans didn't. But, uh, but anyway, we were thinking about these things. Louis Alvarez, if you'd like to read some of his responses to intelligence taskings. Well, there's a lot of you here. I was going to say send me an email. All of a sudden, that's a very scary prospect. But, uh, but I think most of you know where to find me if you'd like to know more about this aspect of our story. So race for the atomic bomb. Why is there a question mark there? We were in a perceived race with Nazi Germany in particular. We really thought that the Germans could have a nuclear weapon tomorrow. And I want you all, again, think about that for a minute. Hitler not only has nuclear weapons, but he's the only one with nuclear weapons. Do let that terrible thought sink in. That's what we thought that we were up against during the Manhattan Project. Now, fortunately, the Germans did not make an awful lot of progress, something that me and my buddy Tom over there are still looking into periodically. Oh, I just woke him up. There he is. A very interesting question. He'll correct me during Q&A. But, uh, but anyway, we didn't know that during the war. So there is a perceived race going on at this point in time. Should mention that the Japanese also had a nuclear weapons program of relatively small scale that is often overlooked. But uh, both the Germans and the Japanese are trying to develop, to some degree, nuclear weapons. Now, back here, we have our first Manhattan Project breakthrough and arguably one of the greatest scientific experiments ever conducted December 2nd, 1942. Remember I mentioned Fermi's first reactor at Stagg Field. They fire that thing up, it runs for four or five minutes, the world's first self-sustaining controlled nuclear reaction. If you can produce a controlled nuclear chain reaction, you can also produce an uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction. What is an uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction? Yeah, it's a bomb. And so we know that it can be done. And as others have noted, that may have been the most sensitive secret of the war, to know that it could be done. So this is a big deal. It also, uh, some might date the beginning of the nuclear age, the atomic era, to this great experiment that was performed. Now, I want to introduce another director tonight, and that is Harold Agnew. Does any, now, I know. Who knew Harold? Little applause for Harold Agnew. It's, I knew Harold. Harold was a friend of mine, a friend, a friend to this community and to the laboratory for many, many years. Uh, he was in the room. He was on Fermi's team at the University of Chicago. You can see that arrow pointing to his face over there. Somebody asked Harold one time, well, what was it like to be in the room? One of the greatest experiments ever. And Harold's response, I'm going to paraphrase, and I'll get into the quote that you see up there. Harold said, well, you know, these people who, who uh, 
said, will we change the world? That's a bunch of baloney. It was one of Fermi's experiments, and then we pick it up. I just thought, well, this is just another one of Fermi's experiments, and it worked. I had no reason to doubt that it wasn't going to work, and I just went back to work. Those of you who know Harold, can you hear his voice saying just that? So, uh, so anyway, that was his view of that. Uh, by the way, you can see uh, Leo Zillard over there in his trench coat over on the right middle row, and standing next to him is Leona Marshall Libby. If you're looking for a good read that talks about this, look up her book, The uh, Uranium People. Okay, so highly recommended there. You see Fermi, of course, on the front row over to the left. But this is a really big deal for the Manhattan Project, and uh, I would say for science in history as well. Well, let's talk about bombs. All of you paid, especially up here on the front row, the big bucks to hear about bombs. And so we'll talk about them a little bit tonight. Sorry if you wanted to hear more. Um, I'm going to greatly simplify things because having gone through the records for many years now, it's actually pretty confusing when it comes to terms being confused and timelines and stuff like that. So I am gonna make this the short version of the story. Is that okay? Is that all right? You, you'll support me in this. Hopefully, okay. So, we're gonna start out with gun-assembled nuclear weapons. In a gun-assembled nuclear weapon, you take one critical mass, as I should say, sorry, subcritical mass of fissionable material, I think that should say fissionable up there instead of fissile, take one subcritical mass of fissionable material, you shoot it at another subcritical uh, mass of material and you get a nuclear detonation. Now, does that sound simple to everyone? And it is, and that's why we liked it. It's, it's pretty straightforward. A gun just shooting stuff at each other, let's do that. And so we're going to have the main bomb of World War II and it's gonna be called Thin Man. Do we have any Thin Man fans here? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Thin Man's not gonna work very well. We'll get into that in just a moment. But the, uh, the backup plan, so Thin Man is gonna be our plutonium gun. The backup plan is the enriched uranium gun, which is Little Boy. We all know about Little Boy, right? So know about Little Boy. So what about Thin Man, the main bomb of the war? Well, here during the war, we had 18 Nobel laureates working for the laboratory in one capacity or another. Think about that. 18 Nobel laureates in one place. Uh, one of them is Emilio Segre, an Italian. So he is performing experiments on tiny bits of plutonium that are starting to gradually come to the laboratory. I started to do this in the spring of 1944. The laboratory is about a year old. It's about a year after the Primer Conference. His results are troubling. Trouble is brewing with Thin Man due to a problem called spontaneous fission. So you make plutonium in a reactor, you're gonna get multiple isotopes. Some of those isotopes are gonna emit more neutrons than you want. Why are neutrons important? Remember, that's what we're gonna to use to bust up the nuclei of atoms. So we like neutrons but can we have too many of them? I heard somebody out there say, oh, not too many, and that's right, you can have too much of a good thing. So this spontaneous fissioning is producing unwanted neutrons. So if we take one piece of material and shoot it at another piece of material, we want the bomb to fully assemble and make a mushroom cloud. Uh, if this turns out to be a real problem, the bomb's not gonna fully assemble because it's going to pre-initiate the reaction and it's not gonna work. So Gray continues, as well as others, Edward McMillan and others doing experiments, and in the summer of 1944, we figure out Thin Man's not gonna work. And this is a big problem. Well, we've still got Little Boy, right? Kinda. <laughs> little Boy's the backup plan for a reason, right? You need, a, Little Boy is horribly inefficient. You need a lot of material to make a Little Boy, and we might not have enough anytime soon. We need a plutonium bomb that's more efficient. And we've just lost it. <laughs> so what do we do? So Oppenheimer has his first major crisis at the laboratory. He reorganizes the laboratory, creates two new divisions, uh, among others, but two that are really key. The original X division for explosives, and also the gadget division, G division, weapons physics, to figure out how to make a totally different type of bomb. This is an imploding bomb. So instead of a gun, what we're going to take is we're, we're gonna get our plutonium, we're gonna have a ball of it, we're gonna surround that ball of plutonium with a lot of high explosives, put detonators in the high explosives, set the detonators off, and implode the high explosives and crush the plutonium to supercriticality. Now, does that sound simple? Yeah, it sounds simple, right? But it's harder. <laughs> For one thing, we're gonna to have to take off the rack high explosives 
from like the hardware store, and try and make them do the exact opposite thing that they were designed to do. What are explosives supposed to do? They're supposed to expand releasing energy. Are they supposed to implode on themselves? No, what would they be called if they were? Implosives, there it is. So that is going to be a problem. Also, uh, we're gonna just go buy detonators at Metzger's, right? <laughs> no, we're gonna have to develop those. What about the circuit for firing the detonators? We're gonna have to, there's a lot more parts <laughs> and there's a lot more to figure out with this. And uh, so anyway, we are gonna try and build an imploding bomb as quickly as possible. And uh, so that's why uh, we have two different types of weapons. So little boy, we're gonna have little boy, you all know that this imploding weapon, once it becomes weaponized, is going to be Fat Man. So now we've introduced little boy and Fat Man really quickly, and hopefully that was a quick, satisfying, somewhat explanation of what's going on. So we're up to Trinity now, so we are making a little bit of progress. Now, after talking about all this business about detonators and, and, and explosives and implosives and all this other stuff, are you confident enough to drop it on enemy territory? Uh, maybe not. Because um, what happens if you drop an atomic bomb on the enemy and it doesn't go off? Well, they might be able to recover an enormous percentage of the world's plutonium <laughs> in this case. Right, and that's probably not gonna be a good idea. So we need to make sure that this will work going into combat. Now, little boy, we had one little boy unit and it would have stayed that way for a while because again, making enough enriched uranium is gonna take some time. Uh, but, um, but anyway, if you've ever heard, have you ever heard that little boy went into combat untested? That's not true, is it? Little boy was not subjected to a full scale test. If it was, we would not have had another little boy for a very long time. It was rigorously tested at less than full scale right here at the laboratory. Lots of experiments were done on every component of Little Boy. Dick Malenfant, who's here somewhere, can tell you about some of those experiments that happened during the war. Criticality experiments, which almost completely verified that Little Boy would work. And so with Little Boy, I would say that the scientists were just short of certain that it would work, but not certain. Why? Because you don't know <laughs> for sure until it's showtime. But they were beyond confident, but just shy of certain little boy would work. I think that's fair. Again, Dick Malenfant and others will correct me during Q&A if, uh, if, if they think that I've got that wrong. But remember, Fat Man's more complicated. It's been rushed to completion, so we're going to need to test it somewhere. Now, I'm going to go through the story of Trinity very quickly, although Trinity may be history's greatest single scientific experiment. What do you think? Debate amongst yourselves out there. Uh, wake yourselves up a little bit. Talk about it. We have another candidate with Fermi and think about all the others. But Trinity, when you consider all that happened as a result of Trinity, I think that it's definitely a contender. Uh, I do have a talk and a paper that I recently wrote on Trinity if you want to know more because it will not get the time that it deserves today. Sorry. But we are going to go through it very quickly here. So, uh, so anyway, the Trinity test is, uh, they start planning for Trinity very early. Oppenheimer gives it its name, Trinity, and he doesn't remember exactly how it came about. Some of you may know about this letter he wrote to General Groves in 1962. General Groves is writing his memoir and gets to Trinity. Where'd that name come from? He writes to Oppenheimer in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Where did that name come from? Oppenheimer says, well, I named it, but I don't know exactly why. I just remember I was reading John Donne's poetry at the time. There was a lion in there, batter thy heart, three-personed God. Maybe that inspired it. Beyond that, I haven't a clue. Again, rough paraphrase, but I can share a letter. You can probably find that one on your own. So Oppenheimer gives it its name, and we have to find a site. So of course, uh, I think everybody here probably knows, hey, what better site than the Alamogordo bombing range? Formed in 1942, People are used to explosions there, hopefully we'll have one, and it's already controlled by the military. That sounds like a really good option for me. There were other sites that were selected. If you want to hear about those, you can ask in Q&A, which we're going to save some time for. But I think, I know, Anna, where's Anna? She's, yeah, there she is, she's watching. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is, uh, this is going to be the world's first test of a nuclear device, a nuclear weapon. Do you think we should do some practice first? Practice, 
Practice, yeah. We're gonna have two rehearsal tests for Trinity. The one that most people know about, you can see a picture of it there in the middle. No, that's not the Trinity test, that is the practice test for Trinity. They stacked approximately 100 tons of TNT. You can see it over there. By the way, there's some really great color footage of that uh, that you can watch on YouTube. I'll give you a link in just a little while if you'd like to see it. Uh, beautiful color footage, and I've always called that the I survived photo, because uh, not only are they stacking and compacting these boxes of high explosive with hammers, rubber mallets, rubber mallets, you know. Uh, but also they are pumping in an irradiated slug from a Hanford reactor through tubes through there. Not that that would be highly radioactive to anybody standing within 10 miles, but anyway, um, so we appreciate that. So they set this thing off on May 7th, 1945. They figure out that the uh, instruments are way off. Uh, in fact, I think that they missed the detonation by like a quarter second. Now, you might be thinking, a quarter second sounds pretty good to me. Well, if you're trying to record early fireball phenomena, you've missed the show. And so they recalibrate their instruments based on this test. And uh, the other thing is, remember that, that uh, material, that slug irradiated that they pumped in there? They wanted to learn about fallout, okay? Now, you may be curious about fallout. You may have read in the newspapers within the past few months that downwinders in Trinity, uh, from the Trinity test here in New Mexico. This is still newsworthy. I'm not gonna talk about that in this talk. You can ask me during Q&A, and I do talk about that in the paper that I mentioned earlier. And so don't hold back in Q&A, although it is my birthday. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. Um, so you can only ask me a nice questions tonight. Okay, is that fair? Uh, so, but anyway, you can't ask me about Trinity fallout because all kidding aside, this is still an issue in New Mexico that we should be aware of. They learned that fallout was gonna be a bigger issue than they previously anticipated. And so that's when they started putting in additional measures for protection. Uh, so it's interesting to note, remember, we're in a perceived race with Nazi Germany to build an atomic bomb. The 100 ton test happens about nine hours after, I always get this backwards, um, about nine hours after Nazi Germany formally surrenders. So Nazi Germany's out of the war. Uh, the war's over, and we can all go home, right? Talk done. Now there's a little bit more to it, as we'll see. But anyway, this is a short video. This one does not have sound, and I'm gonna play it for you. There it is, so that is the 100 ton test. Thanks to my good friend, Peter Coran. Peter Coran is a badge holder at Livermore, but he is also an Academy Award winner for restoring old film like that. He lets me use it for free, so Thank Pete by going out and buying his movie, Trinity and Beyond, which you can rent on Amazon for like three bucks. It's actually a really good film hosted by, or uh, narrated by William Shatner. So again, Pete helps me for free. You can help him as well, and you'll enjoy that film and many other things that he's done. Um, now over there on the right, we've introduced a couple of laboratory directors tonight. You've met one, we talked about Harold. That's Norris Bradbury standing in the shot cab of the Trinity, uh, for the Trinity test over on the right. Okay, he was of course the director from 45 until 1970. Must have liked his job. But uh, he is a talk for a different day as well. So this is the one thing that I hate about being a historian. There's really not a lot of drama, is there? <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> yeah, it works. All of you already knew that. Of course, we've got, uh, many of you may have known Jack Abbey. Jack Abbey uh, passed away a few years ago, but he was one of Segre's technicians during the war, and he took that color photograph of Trinity, and uh, probably the most famous picture. It is, uh, it is successful. It goes off at 5.30 in the morning, just about. You see the near exact time up there on the screen. They're supposed to set it off at four in the morning so no one would see it. But it rained, and so they delayed the test, and a lot of people saw it, so they had to issue one of their two press releases. Press release said a, uh, you know, a large pyrotechnic dump blew up at the, uh, at the uh, bombing range there. Nobody was hurt, nothing to see here, go about your business. <laughs> what if an evacuation of a surrounding community would have been called for? Because we did, we had an evacuation detachment. Uh, there was no evacuation. That press release said an ammo dump with gas shells blew up at the bombing range. And uh, so, People from this community or that were evacuated, nothing to see here. So they really were planned for just, had planned for just about everything. This goes off and uh, releases an energy equivalent to 21,000 tons of TNT. And we're gonna talk about why that's an even bigger deal than you might have realized as we continue on in the slides and get close to the end of the war. So here, who wants to hear from the director? J. Robert Oppenheimer. We, right, 
I think that he should have his moment here. We're gonna, I'm going to start this video in just one moment. You probably already heard this quote, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Oppenheimer reflecting on the Trinity test. I think it's important to note that this quote is used often and almost always used in an improper context. Oppenheimer is going to talk about the multi-armed uh, Hindu god of war who is trying to persuade the prince to do his duty and go to war. Now, then people say, you know, that the multi-armed Hindu god of war says, uh, you know, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, to try and psych up the prince to go to war. And Oppenheimer says, I guess we all felt that way. Oppenheimer does not see himself as the multi-armed god of war. He sees himself as the reluctant prince. Now, let me ask you, would you be excited about dropping an atomic bomb even on your worst enemy? Probably not, okay? And neither was Oppenheimer for reasons that we all understand. So do realize that he's not, I have become death. He's like being persuaded to do his duty. And this was not pleasant duty as we're going to see uh, on the final portion of the talk that we're about to get into. So let me get the microphone ready. Is it? Oh. I've done it. <laughs> okay. So, oh, there we go. All right, microphone off, there we go. And heroic efforts by our AV people tonight, so appreciate them as well. I know we had a little bit of feedback there, but, uh, but anyway, with, uh, can't you just see the weight on Oppenheimer? There's more than one account of Oppenheimer's reactions, uh, reaction to this. I'd recommend going out, to, uh, going to YouTube and looking at a film called The Day After Trinity by John Else. A lot of people are interviewed, including Frank Oppenheimer. Uh, Frank Oppenheimer said, we just looked at each other and thought, wow, it worked, and nobody knew it was going to work. <laughs> that was one reaction. Isidore Rabi, who was a Nobel laureate, who I think was a speaker, uh, one of the Oppenheimer Memorial Committee speakers, uh, many years ago, when he saw Oppenheimer, he said, he was like high noon. He had done it. You know, this, he had this strut. And so you get multiple perspectives on this. And I think that that's because there was a range of emotion. Victor Weisskopf said, at first we were elated. Then we were tired. <laughs> then we were worried. This is the range that many people felt and why you will sometimes get contradictory, almost, accounts of the Trinity reaction. Uh, they were elated because this was the grand scientific experiment of the age. They were tired because, I don't know, they had not slept in like 48 hours <laughs> because they were so nervous about this. And do keep in mind that other rehearsal tests conducted on July 14th, two days before, initially indicated Trinity would not work. Okay, I didn't talk about that test. I can tell you more during Q&A if you would like. But, uh, but you know, think about that uh, for a minute. And then, of course, we were worried. Why? Is this being developed as a nuclear deterrent? No. Mutual assured destruction? No. This is being used, this is being developed to be used in war as quickly as possible. And the scientists were already thinking at this point, what's this going to look like? What's World War III with multiple nuclear-equipped nations going to look like? You'd be worried too, especially then. Uh, going back to Trinity, hopefully you've looked at this already. I won't go into a great amount of detail here. But, uh, but anyway, uh, Trinity was conducted on top of a 100-foot steel tower. It uh, 
vaporized the upper portion of the tower, shattered the rest of it, carved out a crater in the ground. And where you see Oppenheimer and his boss, General Grove, standing, that had been underground. And the, that rebar had been encased in concrete. That was the footing holding the tower in place to give you some sense of how powerful that is. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, uh, isn't there a radiological hazard? <laughs> but if you look closely, you'll notice that the general is wearing his booties. <laughs> so they're... They're fine, they're fine. In fact, I have records, a teaser for Q&A. I do know approximately what their dose was because it was recorded during that visit. There's a story behind it. So, I am not, mostly because of time constraints, talk a lot about the end of World War II. And you might be thinking, oh yeah, because you're the lab historian and you don't want to touch that stuff. No, that's, that's not actually the case. In fact, uh, Anna, as my witness, I give a 90-minute lecture just on the atomic strikes. And so if you're interested in that, again, you can, you can let me know. Maybe we can set that up. This is a topic that's very important to me. It is a part of our history. We were not, of course, the delivery system. We don't make policy at the laboratory. We didn't make decisions on this. But this was a technology that Los Alamos uh, was very responsible for. And so we do need to remember what happens when a nuclear, weapons go, when a nuclear weapon goes off. I think that's a pretty important part of deterrence to remember what a nuclear weapon will do. And of course, what happened on the ground at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which we'll get to briefly in a few minutes, uh, was probably beyond anything that you can imagine when it comes to the horrors of what is unleashed by a nuclear weapon. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit. So I am going fast. We can do a lot on this a different night if you would like. And tonight, I'll stick around for Q&A. I mean, you know, you're not gonna be able to see the end of the game anyway, right? So we might as well just make an evening of it. <laughs> it's, um, so remember, our initial goal is to beat Hitler to an atomic bomb. Hitler's now dead, killed himself at the end of April, Nazi Germany collapsed. So now we've created a technology that gives policymakers another option for trying to bring the war to an end. Other things that we had tried were really not working well at this point. We'll talk about the state of Japan in just a moment. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, there is a committee that is put together to assess potential targets, again, creatively called the Targeting Committee, and Oppenheimer is on that. There were uh, at least three meetings. We have the minutes for those three meetings, and you can see the people that, uh, other people that attended, again, policymakers, military people, and others from Los Alamos attended those meetings. Uh, potential target cities included the ones that you see on the screen up there. So for those of you who have been to Japan uh, and are familiar with Japan, you might be surprised that Kyoto is on there. Is Kyoto a military target? Now the president said, the president said, we will strike purely, I believe that was the word, purely military targets. Is Kyoto a purely military target? Is it a military target at all? Although I do think uh, Tom can confirm, I think they were doing a little bit of nuclear weapons work there that goes, uh, yep, we got the nod from Tom. But uh, anyway, uh, this was a psychological target and General Groves wanted it. What do, what do you mean? Nuclear weapons are very much weapons of psychology, okay? We were already good at leveling cities. We had done that before. The issue is that for a conventional bombing raid, there are countermeasures. If I send 500 planes to your city, what are you gonna do about it? You're gonna scramble what fighters you can get together, right? You're gonna man the anti-aircraft guns. You're gonna shoot at my planes. You're gonna kill some of my people. Because remember, I send 500 planes there. I'm putting 5,000 Americans in harm's way to get shot at. Do we have any volunteers? Yeah, they can do that. They can sound the alarm, they can hide. Uh, both, uh, we encouraged people in Japan to leave their homes. We dropped millions of leaflets on Japan warning them about bombing raids, not nuclear raids specifically until after the atomic strikes. But telling people, look, we don't wanna kill civilians, but bombs don't have eyes and we know you're making stuff down there. So we recommend you get out. There's countermeasures for that. Now, what about an atomic bomb? What is the countermeasure for an atomic bomb in 1945? There's none. So this is essentially an irresistible weapon. So we're going to drop an irresistible weapon on Kyoto. No, it's not a military target. We know that it's a cultural center. We know that it's a place of learning, a place of, of shrines and history. Why would we do that? Because if you don't surrender now, we're not only going to destroy your cities, we're going to destroy your people and your heritage, your history. 
And that's where Secretary of War Stimson says, okay, time out, guys. We, we don't want to do that. Uh, that's, uh, you know, Kyoto is not a military target at all. Uh, and uh, I, I spent my honeymoon there, so I'd kind of like to go back someday. Uh, and so Kyoto is taken off the list to General Groves' chagrin there. But again, it's a psychological weapon. We want to show the Japanese it is in your best interest to stop now. We're trying to break their will to resist. Uh, anyway, the Army Air Corps agrees to reserve Kyoto, Hiroshima, Yokohama, Kukura, and Niigata. These cities were still intact. Why? Because they weren't important? No, these were, these were important cities. These were important military cities. Japan was not hardly touched until very late 1944 because we didn't have any place to effectively bomb them from. And so in late 1944, early 1945, there's still a lot of cities. Now they are being reduced to ash in the opening months of 1945. But yeah, we've still got some, we'll reserve these for you. Because what point is it to drop an atomic bomb on something that's already destroyed? Destroy <laughs> Tom likes my quote, destroying nothing, as it turns out, is not very impressive. So we wanna take a healthy, important city and completely destroy it. Instantly. Let's see what happens. And of course, you already know. Uh, so again, this kind of already talks, so we're a little bit ahead. This talks about what I just talked about, psychological aspects. If you'd like to read targeting committee meeting minutes and things like that, so that's something that I can provide. You can find it online pretty easily as well. You can see General uh, Groves' quote up there. He always thought that it would take two nuclear weapons to end Japanese resistance. Uh, that's going to turn out to be the case. I don't know if that was just a lucky guess. Of course, he was writing that many years later. But uh, you can see an example of one of the warning leaflets that had been dropped on Japan. Again, warming of conventional bombings, but not specifically of nuclear attack, because we want to preserve this secret. We want to maximize the shock of this new irresistible weapon. Okay, we don't want to tip anyone's hand. So the first strike is launched against Hiroshima. It's a large industrial city with an important army depot. And uh, it was also an important part, uh, port, I should say. Uh, thanks to my friend Tom Kunkel over there, I can quantify this military value for you. There were, look at the specificness of the account, of the count of soldiers there. Nearly 31,000 army soldiers in Hiroshima at the time of atomic bombing. That number does not include sailors. And remember, Hiroshima is also an important uh, Navy port as well. And of course, you've also got thousands of Koreans who are turning those cities into fortresses as well. Sounds like a pretty reasonable military target to me, but it is a city. And I do think that we should point out at this time, remember, President Truman said we're going to strike purely military targets. This is a very military target, but is it a purely one? A purely military target? Well, not, not exactly, but, uh, but anyway, we're going to use Little Boy, the only Little Boy that we have at that point in time for this attack. It is going to be flown aboard the B-29 Enola Gay by Colonel Paul Tibbetts. And you can see Tibbetts there. He's standing second from right. And uh, he knew that this was going to be an important mission. It was going to change the world. The plane itself would probably be an artifact. And lo and behold, it is, which I believe you can see in Washington, D.C. And so he names it after mom. He wanted to make sure that it has a unique name so it becomes the Enola Gay. Uh, and so what does this do? Well, on the morning of August 6, 1945, Little Boy was dropped uh, on Hiroshima. It detonates between 17 and 1,800 feet, and it produces a yield, an official yield of about 15 kilotons, 15,000 tons of TNT. Uh, now, it has been noted, and I've, I've spoken with, uh, again, Dick Malifant, Tom Kunkel, and others about this. Have you ever heard somebody say, instantly, tens of thousands of people were vaporized? Have you heard phrases like that before? That, that's not what happened. V vaporization, being turned completely to gas in an instant, is going to be highly desirable to what actually happens there. The fireball from the atomic bombs did not come in contact with the ground like it did at Trinity. It's way up there. So there's not enough energy to vaporize you. So what are you going to get if you're on the ground instead? You're going to be blinded. You're going to be burned. You're going to receive incredibly high amounts of uh, doses of radiation as well. And so what is, this is something that we had talked about, what is the most common way to die in one of these cities? Multiple life-ending injuries. For instance, you may have received maybe a pretty significant dose of radiation, but what's going to kill you before that? I don't know, maybe the horrific burns that are covering your body? 
As I mentioned before, you've probably read, and if you haven't, I would highly recommend that you read John Hersey's 1946 essay, Hiroshima. You can find it online. It was the entire issue of The New Yorker, I believe, in August 1946. John Hersey goes back and interviews people in Hiroshima. Uh, as bad as that account is, what actually happened in those cities was probably even worse. Okay, so this is, this is hell on earth, okay, to use a cliche. Uh, you can see, you will find estimates of the people killed in the atomic attacks all over the place. And I think that they are credible and controversial for different reasons. The numbers that I have chosen to use come from the Army Pathological Study of the early 1950s. I think this is probably, based on the real experts that I've spoken with, this is probably the best estimate, uh, the best scientific study that was done. And again, I apologize for sounding clinical, at least in this portion of the description. But, uh, but according to that number, by mid-1945, by that report, 64,500 people had died in Hiroshima as a result of one weapon exploding. Okay, uh, so anyway, we mentioned the thousands of Koreans a couple of times. Uh, at least 10 American POWs died in this attack as well. One thing that made Hiroshima desirable is that we didn't think that there were any POWs in the area. There were almost no POWs in the area. Unfortunately, there were a few. And so anyway, this strike completely destroys five square miles of the city. Now very quickly, and again, I know that I'm down to like my last five minutes. Can I have five? Anna's given me the five. Are you excited? We've almost made it, yeah, we've almost made it together. So very quickly here, um, Joseph Stalin, as we mentioned, he is our ally of convenience during World War II. You know, um, I can't really think of anything good to say about Adolf Hitler, except one thing, he brings people together. Even, even the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, so, so anyway, all the way back to 1943, we had been going to the Soviet Union saying, hey, what would you guys think about breaking the non-aggression pact that you have with the Japanese and joining us in the war in the Pacific? I'm pretty sure the response was something like, hey, what would you think about landing in France and helping us out, right? We all know about this. Well, anyway, we do land in France. We have D-Day and all of that. You know that story. What's a little bit less known is that at the Yalta Conference in the spring of 1945, Stalin agrees to help us out in the Pacific. He says, three months after the collapse of Nazi Germany, I will help you out. So remember, what day does fighting stop in Europe? May 8th. Remember the day after the, uh, or about the same time as the 100 ton test. On August 8th, three months later, the Soviet Union declares war on Imperial Japan. And very shortly after that, the Red Army invades Manchuria. Now, as you can see, Manchuria is surrounded on three sides by Red Army. That's not a good place to be. Because the Red Army at this point is not the fighting force that invaded Finland. This is one of the greatest militaries ever assembled. And you're Japanese soldiers in the middle of it. According to Soviet records, about 84,000 Japanese soldiers died in this short campaign. Okay? And so this is a big deal for the Soviet Union to enter the war against the Japanese. But it was not a total surprise. This was not a great shock to the Japanese. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, end of Imperial Japan in just a moment. It's a little bit more tortured than, uh, than sometimes it's given credit for. But anyway, uh, even after one atomic bomb, now we have the invasion of Manchuria early in the morning of August 9th. Uh, I, would, I, I think August 9th has got to be the worst day in Japanese history. Okay, it's going to start out by uh, Stalin's army overrunning you in Manchuria, and uh, around 11 o'clock that morning, we're going to hit, get hit with another nuclear weapon and some bad news. But before we get to that, Kokura is selected as the main target of the next attack. Kokura has, I think, over 5 million square feet of industrial complex. Sounds like a pretty good target to me, one of, uh, home to one of the largest military arsenals in Japan. Nagasaki, like it was, I believe, in the first attack, is also the backup target for this attack. Now, that talk that I mentioned to you earlier has a lot about the Kokura mission. I'm going to skip over it because now we're down to like four minutes, or four and a half. My, uh, is, is what I've got. So we're gonna take a different type of bomb, put it on a different plane, have a different crew fly it, and hope for the same result. You think we're gonna get it? Uh, not, uh, not exactly. Uh, first of all, we're gonna have problems on this mission. Again, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but you can get a flavor up there on the top bullet. These problems are so significant that uh, Nagasaki, or I should say Kokura, is clouded over. They were under orders to visually acquire the target. They could not do that because it was too cloudy. They flew over Kokura multiple times, and at this point, the Japanese are desperately trying to develop countermeasures for nuclear weapons attacks. All of a sudden, one bomber 
matters. And so they're getting shot at. It is decided that they will go to Nagasaki, to the backup target, where they have enough fuel for one run over it. They get to Nagasaki. They fly over the main target. The main target is the port. It's easy to pick out. There's ocean on this side. There's port on the other. Can't miss it. They fly over that. They fly over a mountain to a different vein of Nagasaki. So Nagasaki is kind of the inverted version of Los Alamos. We sit on the top of mesas here. They sit between mountains in Nagasaki. They fly over it. Uh, they fly over the port, over the industrial area, the area, the Urakami uh, Industrial Valley. They drop the bomb. It explodes directly over a series of Mitsubishi-run war armaments factories. And the mountain shields, to some degree, the main population center that was closer to the port. So as you'll notice, the yield is greater. This is 21 kilotons, just like uh, the Trinity device. You'll also notice that there are few people who are killed for that reason. It detonates over a more lightly populated but very heavily industrialized portion of Nagasaki. Again, more on that for a different night. So, and again, we have thousands of Koreans who are killed and uh, hundreds of Chinese died in this attack as well. So this is where it gets complicated. And we don't have time to be complicated because Anna's standing up now. And she's got backup from David Israelowitz over here. So I'm, I'm not going to mess around. So as we bring this to a close, uh, Japan's government was divided. Have you heard of the division of the government? You have one clique that is primarily made up of military people. You have another clique that is primarily made up of civilian leaders. The civilian leaders are known as the peace party. The, the truth is both sides were interested in peace on certain terms. The military wanted a lot of terms. The peace party just said, look, make them guarantee that we can keep the emperor. Okay? So the peace party had demands. Uh, they argue and argue and argue the night after Nagasaki. They cannot come to any resolution. And so something unprecedented has happened. They approach the emperor. We can't agree, sir. The emperor comes out, gives a speech. You can read a transcript of it. It's not word for word because it was created l later by one of the people who was there. But you will see that the emperor authorizes them to try and make peace. So on August 10th, the Japanese reach out to the United States and say, look, we're ready to quit. If you promise, you will not threaten the sovereignty of the emperor. Hmm, okay. We get that agreement. What do you think we would do with it? That's not acceptable. We said unconditional surrender. You will remember after Potsdam, the Potsdam Conference, after Germany collapsed, we demanded unconditional surrender. So we write back and we tell them that. The emperor is going to be expected to do this and this and this and this, and there is nothing about guaranteeing his position in that response. The Japanese stew on this for a few days, and ultimately they agree to an exceptionally delicate, exceptionally tenuous peace at that point in time, not knowing exactly what was going to happen to their god on earth, the emperor. Now, the god on earth, our emperor, Hirohito, he is retained by the military governor of Japan, Douglas MacArthur, who you see up there on the left, because as it turns out, having God tell his soldiers to put their guns down is kind of useful. <laughs> and so Hirohito sticks around. Uh, it's debatable whether you think he's a war criminal. I think he was, but... Again, do we really want to resume this conflict? And so at that point, he becomes kind of a decoration at state dinners for the rest of his very long life. You can see our response to the August 10th, uh, much of our response to the August 10th surrender um, offer from the Japanese there on the screen. And so anyway, the way that I would think about this is you will hear people debate, well, atomic bombs won the war and ended it. And you'll hear people say, well, they had nothing to do with ending the war. We didn't need to use them. They weren't necessary. And all these different things. This debate will go on forever. Because World War II, I think, you'll notice I use the phrase I think, was the product of many ingredients. Just like making a cupcake. You need a lot of ingredients to make a good cupcake, right? Or so I'm told. I couldn't do it. But, um, but anyway, that was World War II being pushed to the brink of starvation by the Allied blockade, the Soviet entry into the war, years of conventional defeats, all of these things, multiple nuclear weapons. I forgot to mention that Nagasaki, three of our scientists dropped a letter on the Japanese telling them that there were more on the way. And oh yes, we could have produced an atomic bomb, an imploding weapon about every 10 days for the rest of 1945. We could put another weapon into combat on August 17th, August 18th. So it was a promise that could have been made good on. Uh, fortunately, at this point in time, though, we have broken the will of the Japanese to continue to resist. The military folks, I think, would have fought to the death with everybody in the country had they had their way. Fortunately, they didn't. But uh, the war comes to an end. 
And so, again, this will always be debatable because a lot of these ingredients, they're unquantifiable. So, you know what? It's okay to have your opinion on this. <laughs> it's subjective history. And so, uh, so anyway, can't talk more about that today because it's, uh, the presentation is pretty much over. You can see about a quarter of the emperor's speech. You probably can't read it out there, but this makes for pretty good reading. I don't have time to read it to you, but uh, basically says, yeah, you know, things haven't gone our way, so we have decided to bring the war to an end. Let's not use the surrender word on that. But uh, anyway, uh, before we go to our final slide, I do want you to look at this one. You'll see Stalin's quote over there. I don't agree with Stalin often, but in a way, I can't quantify the horrors of World War II for you. Numbers, it's just a statistic. But do remember that each of these numbers translates into immense human suffering. Look at these numbers. Hope we never see this again. We only lost a little over 300 Americans a day. Look at the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union lost 15 to 20,000 people killed as a result of military action every day on average of World War II. If we asked our friends in China, I'll use the term loosely today, <laughs> with the Chinese government, if we asked them how many of your people alone were killed under Japanese occupation, I do think the number you see on the screen is high, 20 million. They've not forgotten that, by the way. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, that is what a world war looks like, and that's what we're in the business of trying to prevent at the laboratory and throughout the DOE weapons complex. And so a final slide today, because Anna's really mad now because I've only got like 15 seconds left, according to my watch. Back here at the laboratory, I think this was filmed two weeks ago by Christopher Nolan and crew over in front of Fuller Lodge. This is a picture of the actual ceremony, so I don't have Matt Damon, but uh, I do have General Groves. And I don't have Cillian Murphy, but I have our good friend, J. Robert Oppenheimer, there. Back in October of 1945, this is kind of, I guess, Oppenheimer's official last day on the job. He receives the Army Navy E Award for Excellence in Wartime Production. We have that scroll that General Groves has and the Army Navy E Award flag on display over at our main building there at the laboratory at the National Security Sciences Building as a reminder. And hopefully you can read Oppenheimer's speech up here. Uh, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. It's easy to track down. I can help you if you can't find it. But I think that as you read through that, and he talks about, you know, after seeing this war, we've just all got to learn to get along. And you might be thinking, well, that sounds kind of naive. You know, I, I, don't think, I don't think J. Robert Oppenheimer was naive at all. I, I think that J. Robert Oppenheimer was hopeful. As he looked around the world and he saw that, how could you not be anything but hopeful, especially now that nuclear weapons are in the world? And so I think that this is very much our charge today as we pursue peace as a laboratory, as a community, and as a nation in a world that, as we've all sadly been reminded lately, remains very, very dangerous. So I thank you for being here tonight. I don't know how long that actually took. I think I will owe Andy some money or some for lunch or something. But uh, thank you for your patience and your evening, and I look forward to chatting with you. Um, so the question was, did the Japanese produce an atomic bomb? Uh, so the short answer is no. Uh, there are people, so a couple of thoughts on this, and I'm going to invite Tom to chime in too. Many of you probably knew the late Terry Hawkins, who was a friend to, to many of us in our community. Terry knew quite a bit about this. Uh, we don't have a lot of documentation on their program. Some of it was destroyed. Some of it, which actually ended up, I think, in the United States, was sent back to Japan, and we've not been able to reach it. Is that right, Tom? Uh, to Professor Paul, uh, uh, Kuroda's papers, I believe. There are things that you will hear out there about some kind of nuclear device being detonated in Korea, but uh, you know, I don't know a lot about that myself. When we're talking about an atomic bomb, we're talking about what we saw on the screen, a deliverable uh, weapon 
Okay, a deliverable weapon, not a science fair project, not a uh, reactor or something like that. So the Japanese producing a deliverable nuclear weapon or anything resembling a nuclear weapon, I, I would say no to that. Uh, is there any other one else? Tom, you have anything you'd want to add to that or correct? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, no, this is a very good question, though. Uh, the Japanese did not have a big program. It was uh, the scientists were in conflict, I believe, with the army, which is one of the reasons why it didn't work uh, that well. Uh, but, uh, but again, we were primarily concerned with the Germans uh, because they had produced fission because, first, uh, because they had this pedigree of engineering, because they had been a center of physics, chemistry, metallurgy, all of these other fields. And so they seemed the likely candidate, and also had plenty of access to uranium ore as well. So the Germans really did have the basic ingredients. Uh, it was a little bit more difficult for Japan, but no, uh, I, I would say no. Just no <laughs> to that. Thank you. Hmm? Are there more questions? Do you have the question group? There's one back there. Um, my question is, um, the, the test that you mentioned in Chicago um, for the chain reaction, what was the actual danger to an urban center such as Chicago during a test like that? Um, well, we do have some experts in the room who I think can answer that, probably more than one. So I'll get things started. And Anna is actually one of them, I, I think. Um, so yeah, this is probably not a great idea, having a hand-built reactor under the football field at the University of Chicago. And uh, so I guess to show to some extent, uh, of course they moved it out of the city and it became Argonne, right. So, so it became Argonne National Laboratory. And so um, I, I think that with, a, uh, with Fermi's reactor, now that's an interesting question. Where, is Dick Malenfant still here? I'm curious to know if Dick has an opinion of, of that. Oh, he's right in front of my face. There he is. Dick, what do you, what do you think about the question? And uh, again, I, I forgot to repeat it, but what is the danger of an accident with CP1 at the University of Chicago? An accident versus an explosion. The probability of an explosion, I believe, is negligible. The reason being, the cross-section for nuclear fission decreases as the temperature increases. And so in a, an excursion, Slow thermal reactor, the temperature will increase and the excursion will decrease. The fission rate will decrease. I've demonstrated that many times. I, I bet he'd give a presentation on that, or three, if you're interested. So hopefully that answers the question. It's nice to have backup. Dick Malenfant, everyone. It's a uh, good friend for many, many, many years, and a very good question, uh, too. Uh, let's see, other questions, comments, suggestions, corrections, we take them all. Steve, yes. You mentioned you knew the dose rate for Oppenheimer at the uh, side after you met. How much did they get? Are you curious? Okay. So um, that visit that we saw, I'm probably going to get the day wrong by a day or two. But I believe that that was September 9th. It may have been the 7th. And so... After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I know this is gonna shock you, but there was a lot of sensationalistic reporting in the news. Um, you know, these cities are not gonna be inhabitable for like 100 years and different things like this. This was new to everybody and the media was trying to keep up with this, uh, this incredible world changing news, okay? And so as these reports were coming in, I think that you know, there were people within the Manhattan Project, General Groves, for instance, who was listening to this and going, well, that's, that's not true. We need to show the public that you know, it's, this is not being made out to be what it actually is. And so that picture was taken during a press visit. The Manhattan Project invited the press to come and visit Ground Zero. And by Ground Zero, as you saw in the picture, like actual Ground Zero. Um, this visit was carefully controlled, as, uh, as won't surprise any of you, of course both from a security standpoint and also from a radiological standpoint. Uh, now, for one thing, the people who went in there, the uh, mostly press reporters, but there were several scientists and other military uh, people from the Manhattan Project, uh, they were given dose, uh, well, I, I don't 
think they were given dosimeters for that visit. I'm not sure. But they did rough calculations because they knew what the radiation levels were in the area. So remember, it's not just how high the radiation level is, it's also how much time you spend there. So these are the two things that we're looking at. So the amount of background radiation, <laughs> background radiation is something that is known, and we can control how long they're in there. And therefore, we can come up with a pretty good dose. Now, if everybody hangs out like away from the crater, they'll get a lower dose, but like if they're right in the middle, you know, they may get higher, but we can do a pretty good approximation. So I think that the cap on that, uh, from a time standpoint, was like 45 minutes. You go in there, take pictures, mill around for 45 minutes, and then everybody was herded out. And so I believe, I say I believe, because I, I do have this recorded in that paper that I can share with anybody who is interested, uh, that the average dose that they guessed was about one today, one retkin an hour, something like that. They got one R, uh, back to, or, or REM today. Back then it was Rentkin, but they're roughly the same. Of course, Dick Malifant and other experts are going, oh, give me a break. But it, for our purposes, for my purposes, they're approximately the same. So one R is not very much. I believe that, uh, and correct me, because I bet that we have some experts. If I remember correctly, to put this in perspective, the average dose that a DOE worker today can get is 25 rem over the course of a year. Is that right? Or is it 75? What is it? I heard somebody say no. So somebody knows the answer over there. Yes. Uh, Millirem. So, okay, so it's, it's higher a percentage than I thought. No, it goes this way, this way is lower. Okay. <laughs> Get that on camera. Get that on camera. It's a Millirem, okay, so, so that gives some perspective to the Trinity visit, and th yes, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, other things with radiological safety, they were allowed to take samples of Trinitite. So, you know, Trinitite is the melted sand, so the fireball hits the ground, melts the sand, the lighter particles go up into the atmosphere in the form of smoke, the heavier particles literally rain back down to the ground, you have molten sand which resolidifies into Trinitite, and you could take some, but it had to be a certain size. And Oppenheimer, I believe that Oppenheimer himself said, look, you, uh, we would recommend not keeping even these small pieces next to you for like a month. You, <laughs> you know, put them somewhere else. So, so you know, again, it, it's like, well, how could they let somebody take a material that would burn? Well, your stove will burn you. The sun will burn you. And they thought, well, you know, this is an acceptable risk if you know what you're doing. And so, uh, again, I do have some interesting records on that. And uh, I'm glad you asked, Steve. And I appreciate the assist over there. We have some guys at the exhibit. Step up, Any more sure. questions from the audience? There's somebody. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and, and I will mention while Anna's making the hike back there, I have a personal YouTube page. I do not get money off of it if you think that I'm like hawking the page. <laughs> uh, but I've got over 50 laboratory related videos up there. There's a lot of footage from Trinity. There's a lot of uh, historical lectures uh, by different people talking about different subjects that we've covered tonight. If you look up Historian Alan B. Carr, I think it will take you right there and do check out the uh, videos. Make sure it's Historian Alan B. Carr because there's also a famous orthodontist, Alan Carr. There is a uh, British comedian, Alan Carr. I think he's the most famous famous of us. Uh, but uh, anyway, hopefully you'll find some of those videos interesting. So we have our next Last one back here. Question. Last question, okay. Mm -hmm. okay I want to hear your opinion if you knew that Professor Mishnah, who you might consider the father of modern physics in Japan, and I believe he's rubble brain and he's the weapons right away. And even though they didn't get along with like developing nuclear weapons, I think they probably understood what was possible. And I've heard rumors that on August the 7th, he was sent to Hiroshima and correctly deduced that it was a uranium bomb and correctly deduced that we probably could only have one. And so he reported back that, well, it probably only got one. And then the dropping of the second immediately told me that that was untrue and to expect more to come in the future. Did that have a role that, that, that you know, like, 
Did we need the second one to convince them that more would happen? Well, the, the, so part of that, I, Tom, you may have some thoughts on this, because Tom's really dug into a lot of the old records uh, during his spare retirement time and has helped me a lot with this type of stuff. I don't know uh, the first part, so I'll get to the second part, you know, was the second bomb necessary kind of thing in just a moment. But do we know that the uh, government in Japan ever considered this, that they probably didn't have another? Do you know if there's documentation on that? I've heard this before, but Tom and I, we, we want the primary source, mm, so. We have the back turn, it's actually the story should have repeated. It was, the Japanese were very smart in atomic physics, nuclear physics, they were um, leaders in the world in this, and yes, they were well aware of the possibility of explosive nuclear chain reactions. And they were well aware of the possibility that but our records are very limited. Almost everything is speculation, post-war statements, statements made well after the war. And the few amounts of uh, archival material that exist from Japan during the war differ a lot from the post-war statements. And I've come to the conclusion, you know, asking what happened a month later, a year later, two years later, Rose remembrances in 1962 is Go look for the original records. All of these things will be, be altered by the course of time. So it's fair to say we do not know what went on in Germany and what happened to, in Japan in the way of the nuclear weapons program. But I think it's fair to say that there's no evidence that they pursued beyond the, the most basic theoretical understandings, the most basic considerations of how to separate the uranium. They were aware of the existence of plutonium. So there was certainly knowledge of, of, of atomic weapons, of the possibility of atomic weapons in Japan. Did they think there were I haven't found any direct evidence of that. That is a period record predating the end of the war. There were any kind of thoughts of, of how many that might be. Post-war statements or rape are mostly speculation in my, in my mind. I just wanted to talk about just one mention of the safety of the static field reactor. I think it's important to keep in mind that wasn't just the first time that the reactor ran. It had been in use for a long time, weeks. Uh, weeks was a long time back then, but months. And what was called an exponential nuclear reactor. This is a nuclear reactor which is known to be subcritical. So you put some neutrons in at the source and you see how fast they decay away. You change the reactor, you build it a little bigger, you put some more uranium in, and they don't disappear, they don't disappear as fast. They hang around a bit longer. So it's a creep-up experiment. So when Harold mentioned this is just another of uh, Fermi's experiments, yeah, it was just another of Fermi's experiments. There have been many of these done. And this is just the first one that made that little excursion and made it super critical, a prompt critical, not prompt critical, that's reactor, a bomb. It made it critical at the time. So keep in mind when you're thinking about that static field reactor, that was ran in such a way to guarantee safety. And, and Tom, thank you very much. You know, Tom is a, a dear friend and a great collaborator. He does a lot of my work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I appreciate him, Dick Malenfant, uh, the others that I've mentioned as well. I do want to talk about the, uh, I guess, our last, the last part of that question. And this does come up. Was it, uh, was it necessary to use a second bomb? Maybe that's not the best way to phrase it. But to uh, think about this, I, I, uh, I mentioned those slides that I have about the end of the war, which Tom helped me greatly with. I can share those with anyone who's interested because they refer to the original documentation. Because we really wanted to go back to, you know, what do the actual records say? What you will see in Japan is different reports from different people who are facing different sets of circumstances. For instance, you have military people talking to each other. They're downplaying nuclear weapons. They're saying, well, you know, we can figure this out. We've got these countermeasures, not a big deal. And people who want to make the case, and it's a fair one, that nuclear weapons did, played a limited role will cite that. A lot of times they won't tell you that, well, of course the military was trying to downplay it because they were not ready to surrender. 
The military wanted to continue fighting. They would have given everybody in the country, taken them to the brink, if they had had their way. You can see you know, General Anami speaking at the war conference, the final war conference. Uh, he would kill himself, I think, within an hour, a few hours after that. Disem ritualistic disembowelment, not a pleasant way to go either. But, uh, but I do think that he was convinced that, uh, yeah, we are going to go unless they give us all these conditions that we want. So the military is gonna downplay everything. On the other hand, you see a little bit different a response from others, <laughs> others in the cabinet who are concerned about this new weapon. You see the emperor, if, uh, I know I didn't read it, but on the screen, the emperor specifically alludes to the use of nuclear weapons in his speech about this most cruel new bomb that we can't do anything to stop. Uh, similar statements were made in the same conference to, I guess I would say to rebut the military people who were downplaying it. So you can kind of pick your side. If you wanted to say, well, nuclear weapons made the difference, you can quote these guys. If you want to say they didn't make any difference at all, you can quote those guys. Or what I try to do is present an impression of everything that was going on, uh, which maybe I did to some good extent or not. You know, it's, uh, as Tom alluded to, our documentation is pretty spotty when it comes to these things. But I do think that both weapons did play a role in ending the war. I think that the second weapon was used, there's, a, there's a, several reasons why you would use a second nuclear weapon. One was to demonstrate that you have more. Another one was the Japanese military is still trying to kill our people as quickly and efficiently as they can. And the list goes on and on. And again, they are included, more reasons than that in my presentation. Uh, it is, as I mentioned, horrific to think about what happened at the end of World War II. Um, and sometimes I think when we talk about these things, we, we lose sight of what these atomic weapons will do. But uh, I, my, I think, my opinion, you asked for my opinion, I think the use of nuclear weapons played an important role in ending the war. Maybe the instrumental role in ending the war at that point in time. But they did not operate in a vacuum. There were all of these other factors that were very briefly mentioned uh, earlier that, uh, that were uh, that to it as well. That's my opinion. And as you all know, you're going to get a lot of opinions on all sides of this. And I, do, I strongly encourage you to look at those other ideas and uh, send me their primary source documentation, because I will change my narrative based on the actual documents. It's the other stuff I don't really trust. He his mind, I will, unless you, how unless much? You show him the real documents. That's right, and she knows, because she sent me a lot of them. Yes, thank God, I